and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a second round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. Like what you hear? Click the thumbs up. Don't care for it? Click the thumbs down. Good luck to all of our contestants. Necrosis. Written by an, an author unknown. Performed by Benjamin Lisman. For Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. And the Evil Idol Competition. I should tell you about it. Maybe you know it already. The rise of the number of suicides, the homicides, the murders, the crazy people, and then those shambling things that came afterwards. I was there when we discovered the spores that started this whole mess. In the 1980s, an independent group of scientists, myself included, embarked on an expedition to Africa to search for a notorious, maddening substance known only to locals as Wainsin. Apparently, this substance was spread through beautiful bloom flowers, which were found around the area. When inhaled, the Wainsin spores cause madness and or dementia in the natives. The effects vary, though most of the time they turn mad and seek a desire to murder others. I saw them stab themselves with spears and sticks and such, bashing foreheads as they went. They inflicted wounds into themselves. Some injuries were enough to kill them, naturally. But they still kept on moving. We studied a victim in a lab west of Kyuyu, sealing him in a plate-glass sealed room with one-way mirrors. We left him adequate food and water and sealed him inside. From him we learned of the necrosis that was happening to his skin. First the skin pales. In this case, the native turned his otherwise dark skin into a dry, cracked grey. Blotches start to form, then sores. Through weeks of isolation, we saw the skin turn into a grey, cracked husk, into greener sores, blabbering on in Afrikaans. Days later, the man self-terminated. As he was being prepared for burial, we noticed that the corpse was twitching rapidly. It was too strange to be called necrotic twitching. It was as if the corpse still wanted to move. After a rapid succession of twitching, the corpse simply hung limp. We attempted another experiment. Naturally, that led me to my second discovery. The spores induced mutations in the body if tissue damage was severe. Apparently, the spores induced cellular reproduction within the bloodstream, creating cell after cell after cell. We knew something was wrong. A heavily wounded man exhibiting the symptoms of the blown spores started to grow an inhuman amount of muscle and tissue around the injured parts of his body. We sedated him and placed him in an isolation room for study. The results were astonishing. The Wansin spores regenerated parts of the wounded man's body with a red mass that gave a red pigmentation on the person's skin. The infected showed signs of an intense Wendigo psychosis, an insatiable desire to feed on a human's flesh. As the days passed by, I started to get weary and tired. I was also frightened. The other scientists were getting weary too. When the screaming started, we were on our knees. The man screamed his ears out. The screaming went on for days, until we woke up, heard nothing, and saw a bullet hole in his chest. The reddish man lay there. I asked Peters, our hunter, if he had done the euthanasia. No, he said. Angel grabbed my gun when I was sleeping. We saw Angel, the researcher, curled to a fetal position in a corner of the lab, gun in hand. She was sobbing and whispering. When we examined her for cuts and bruises, we saw a bite mark embedded in her arm. It bit me. It bit me. I can't believe it bit me, she whispered. I wanted to take a blood sample from him, and he bit me, so I shot him. I shot, shot, shot him. Through the chest, 
That sick bastard, that sick, sick bastard. We had taken every precaution not to get infected with the Wainson agent to the point of sterilization. Angel was obviously harboring the stage one symptoms of the Wainson complex. As we came closer to restrain her, she knew of our intent, and simply shot herself in the chest, not in the forehead, where the brain will forever slumber, but the chest. After that incident, we decided to get the hell out of there. We gave them proper burials, and left Africa. Due to my colleague's Native American ancestry, we decided to name the condition as the Wendigo Complex. But the thing was, the case was far, far from over. There was a final symptom discovered, and out of the four, this was the worst. The necrotic twitching I spoke of before. It gets worse. A Wayne Sin afflicted man was witness killing himself. As the coroner prepared his tools for the autopsy, he found the man shambling towards the door, ribcage exposed. The man, grey-skinned and pupilless, let out a long moan before falling to the floor, viscera spreading all around. We were frightened with the news of the reanimated corpse, frightened beyond comparison, to say the least. But I suppose it was already too late for us. Spreading the agent would only happen one way, through inhalation of spores. But with the outbreaks of Ebola near Blom infested areas, the spores adapted, assimilated the characteristics of the virus, turning it into a deadly, agile weapon. The agent could now spread through the blood. As such, the occurrences of the infected were spreading, but the virus didn't spread enough to gain people's attention until two months later. Bizarre murders occurred around the region. People were apparently eaten. Sightings prevailed of groups of people eating other groups of people. It was mad. Insane. To the few who knew about the Wendigo complex, this was a depressing thought. Through the months until the revelation of the massive Wendigo outbreak, I've lost almost all my colleagues. They died by their own hands, guilty of the monsters they had become. The first official sightings of the now-named Wendigo men were in a small Floridian island, Casey Key, but by that time the virus was already spreading across the Americas, Europe, Asia, Africa, through birds and the like. Innocent people around the world became insane. The Wendigo men didn't stay for long, but their slow, shambling relatives took their place. We, the remaining scientists who first discovered the Wendigo virus, hesitated to call them what they really were. Just like in the movies. The virus was smart. The whole purpose of the symptoms was to turn the person into those freaks. Apparently the virus not only causes necrosis, but causes already dead tissue to reanimate. The blom wayne sin spores were acting as some kind of reanimating reagent. It was terrifying to think that almost everyone in the world was shambling stupidly, craving for the flesh of the living. But the virus was airborne, and the majority of the population had turned into the Wendigo men. I don't know why I survived. The surviving group of scientists, I included, were escorted by the convoy of the President of the United States towards an underground bunker in the skies of a farming ranch. We huddled up there, waiting for a miracle. I still remember the courageous, ambitious look on the President's face a decade ago. He was unfazed from all the horrors that had happened around him. The soldiers looked up to him as a true leader of this band of Americans that were. He's dead now. Every year his strength waned. The moans of the living dead echoed through every night we spent under that concrete bunker. One half-baked soldier grudgingly placed a microphone towards a horde of the undead. The moans echoed through the military bunker. Every year there seemed to be that one person that flips out, and our numbers were steadily decreasing. Gradually the beasts got in. The president, tired and weary, embraced the freaks with open arms. I killed him myself. He got a chunk of my flesh while I killed him, though. <coughs> Shit, I just coughed. Well, the necrovirus just spread through my lungs, I suppose. I wonder why I'm not going crazy. 
Just remember, when one gets infected, he is not the same person as before. That person's dead. This is just his body. Shoot him in the head. Be careful of the water, too. Drink bottled shit. The virus is waterborne in some part of America. What else? Necrosis. The necrovirus usually causes necrosis. I said that before. Just watch out for patches of skin that seem odd. Dry, itchy skin. If you read this, I cannot tell you how common those words were. But I don't know. I'm afraid to say the other lines. I can't speak of them. It's too horrible. I can't. I just can't. What I'm going to become is ten times worse than anything ever imagined in this world. I could feel it eating away my body now. I'm dying, and I can't whimper. All my strength has gone to locking myself up. It's all for you. I stock the closet at the back with supplies, a week's worth of food, my remaining boxes of shotgun shells, pistol clips, ammo, and ten days' worth of gas. Drive as far away as Mexico, whoever you are, because they're going to spread, and then go to Antarctica. As for me, I don't know. Still, I'm dead. Deader than dead. Its muzzle was caked with blood. I tried to shoot myself in the head just a few hours ago, but I decided not to. I'd shot one of those things in the face first, and when I pushed the muzzle against my temple, it was still so hot that it branded the skin of my forehead with a penny-shaped hole. I winced a bit from the pain, though I thought of you, and I guess my pain didn't matter anymore. What mattered was the pain I'm going to cause you. I don't know how you... There goes my uvula. Look at that thing. Throbbing its last. It doesn't even hurt a bit, even though blood just wells inside my mouth. I just need a little water or something. I'll wash that off. I'm so itchy, damn it. My right arm is all dry, patchy at parts. What? I have to scratch. Yeah, itchy gone. I mean, the itch is gone. Maybe I'll just sit here and wait for it to get me. I can't pull the trigger. I want to die, but I can't. People. Upstairs. Not dead. I see. I scratch. I scratch. It's really not gone. People. Tasty, people tasty. Might as well go there and eat them. I eat and eat and eat and eat. The dead go, don't see me. I eat tasty. Thanks for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via a thumbs-up or thumbs-down vote. By doing so, you'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. At the close of voting on August 15th, based on your votes, the top 25 contestants will advance to the third round, which begins September 1st, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.